Good evening, one. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's leadership lecture series. We are very excited to have with us Ms. Tamika McKay, who is the Enterprise Systems Manager, Infrastructure Systems Manager for Broward County Public Schools, um, who's going to be joining us not only as a, an alumna of our executive MPA program, um, but is going to be sharing it with us information about her public service journey. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Do you want me to get started? Yes, feel free to get started when you're ready. Okay, all right. Well, first of all, I want to give a special thanks to uh, Dr. Carballo and the team at FIU for this wonderful leadership lecture series, which I've been enjoying myself, and I'm honored to be a participant. As Dr. Carballo mentioned, I'm a proud alumna of the FIU EMPA program, cohort five, class of 2018. And currently, I'm the infrastructure manager for Broward County Public Schools. And I'll get into a little bit more of exactly what that means shortly. But first, I want to share a speech that I wrote for a former speaking engagement. And I feel it's appropriate to share today. So I hope you'll enjoy it. After the speech, I'll talk about my journey and then uh, we'll go into questions and answers. So the name of the speech is what are the odds? According to the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, the single most reliable indicator of drug or alcohol dependence is family history. So children of drug, addic drug addicted parents are eight times more likely to develop an, addic an addiction. One could deduce that if you are the child of a drug addicted mom and want to be successful, what are the odds? Not so good. According to the US Department of Health and Human Services, fatherless children are at a dramatically greater risk of drug and alcohol abuse. Children in fatherless homes are almost four times more likely to be poor. And according to NPR, girls in fatherless homes are four times more likely to get pregnant at, as teenagers leading to poverty. One could deduce that if you are the child of a drug addicted mom, grow up in a fatherless home, and you wanna be successful, what are your odds? Not so good. Studies find that students whose parents did not go to college are less likely to enroll in challenging high school courses. Economic mobility states that a child's academic performance is likely higher if he or she has highly educated parents and lower if the child has less educated parents. One could deduce that if you are a child of a drug addicted mom, grow up in a fatherless home, both parents never finished high school, and you want to be successful, what are the odds? Are you with me? Not so good. In 2015, only 12% of adults in the US ages 25 and older held advanced degrees. Only 8% of African Americans 25 years and older held advanced degrees. One could deduce that if you are a child of a drug addicted mom, grew up in a fatherless home, both parents never finished high school, are African American, and wanting to pursue an advanced degree and want to be successful, what are the odds? Not so good. According to the Center for American Progress, Blacks are significantly underrepresented in important fields such as engineering, mathematics, and the physical sciences. The gender gap is particularly pronounced in engineering and computer science, where nearly four out of every five doctoral graduates in 2014 were men. White students are more than twice as likely as black students to graduate with degrees in the sciences, mathematics, and statistics. White men earn bachelor's degrees in engineering at more than 11 times the rate of black women. In 2017, 26% of the computing workforce were women and less than 10% were women of color. One could deduce that if you're a child of a drug addicted mom, grow up in a fatherless home, both parents never finished high school, are African-American and female, 
and want to produce, pursue an advanced degree and a career in STEM, and you want to be successful, what are the odds? Not so good. Asian, Black, and Hispanic women make up less than 4% of executive officials and managers. Company leadership around the world remains unbalanced with women accounting for less than a quarter of management positions globally. In 2015, minority women made up fewer than one in 10 employed scientists and engineers. One could deduce that if you're a child of a drug addicted mom, grow up in a fatherless home, parents never finished high school, African-American and female want to pursue an advanced degree in STEM and aspire for a leadership position and want to be successful, what are the odds? Not so good. So can someone beat those odds to obtain a, a, a career in STEM, an advanced degree, a management position in IT, leading an all-male team, creating social mobility with a six-figure salary, and most recently con potentially considering a PhD? You bet they can, but how, you might ask, and I'm glad you asked, by ignoring those odds. That's right, ignoring those not so good odds. Take some passion, some hard work, some uh, mix it with some determination and self-discipline, add a dash of humility and surrounding yourself with family and friends who support you and believe in you, sprinkle it with some favor and faith, you can absolutely turn those odds from not so good to oh, so good. So let's restate it. If you're a child of a drug addicted mom, grow up in a fatherless home, both parents never finished high school, are African American and female, want to pursue a career in STEM and an advanced degree and a leadership position in IT, and you want to be successful, what are the odds? Oh, so good. So that was a speech that I gave at a former speaking engagement specifically devoted to creating more diversity in STEM. And in case you haven't figured it out yet, that person who beat those odds is yours truly, that's me. And uh, I, I speak of these things not because I'm proud of my family's struggles, but I think it's important to show how far you've come, especially for those who feel like the odds may stack up, maybe stack up against them. And it's important for me to give back what I receive. I, and some of you may have, I've already shared this with you, but because both of my parents weren't uh, college educated, I never really had talks about pursuing a professional education. I just concluded that getting a, um, a graduating from high school was successful enough because there were many people around me that didn't even graduate from high school. So up until my senior year in high school, my, my only goals were to get through high school and then get a job in the community and live my life until my my guidance counselor arranged a trip to the Seton Hall Law School in New Jersey. And frankly, I signed up for the law school, for the trip, just to get out of class, to be honest. And uh, it was a pivotal moment for me because when I went to the Seton Hall Law School and I sat in the law library and I saw people that looked like me, that spoke like me, female, African-American, the seed was planted. I started thinking, hmm, well, if she could do it, then maybe I could go to college and maybe I could become a lawyer. So shout out and kudos to all the guidance counselors out there because those were the first seeds that were planted uh, as far as uh, getting um, a professional education. And to be honest with you, because I had not taken those preparatory courses during my high school career, I really didn't have any of the qualifications for uh, to start at college level. I mean, I had to take um, uh, I had to take rudimentary courses just to get up to the college level, and uh, and that was difficult as well. But uh, you know, shout out to the community colleges who take students like me who don't necessarily have that structure or that background to prepare for professional education and help us 
get to where we need to be to do that. So let me tell you about my myself and my journey. So I, I currently work at Broward County Public Schools, which is the sixth, sixth largest district in the nation, over 30,000 employees, 250,000 students, and the largest employer of Broward County. There I oversee the, infer, the Enterprise Infrastructure Services team. And if you're not in IT, you probably don't know what that means, but the simplest terms I could put it in is all of the applications, all of the programs, the business applications, the school applications, and all of the things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis as part of the operations, all of that runs on the plumbing that my team supports. So we're supporting the servers, the backup and recovery, the disaster recovery, the storage, uh, the cloud base. So although I'm not managing a team responsible for programming and, and application related, everything that my team does allows the other teams to do what they need to do. Prior to that, I worked for the town of Davie uh, for 15 years and um, the team that I manage at Broward School, in addition to all of the plumbing, we also provide support for the mainframe, which is the student information system, over four petabytes of data and some web and database management. Additionally, I serve as the equal education opportunity liaison for our department. I also serve on the advisory board for Broward College Computer Science Department and I was recently elected to the board of directors for VMware user group. If you're not in IT, you probably don't know what that is, but it's a very important uh, organization that serves uh, independent users of virtualization. Nevertheless, I, I was also asked to lead a diversity and inclusion task force, which is not something I've ever done before. And to be honest with you, you know, it almost seems like I'm not the right person. But I remember one of my professors at FIU, Dr. Revel, to be specific, he says, as long as you are doing a good job, you will always get asked to do something extra, something new, something unprecedented. And don't let that scare you. Don't let it stop you. Just go and grow and you'll figure it out along the way. So I'm standing on those words of Dr. Revel and wish me luck in this unprecedented role for me. I'm currently enrolled in a second master's degree in computer engineering with an emphasis on cybersecurity, graduating in June of 2021. And I am taking my first doctoral class in the public affairs PhD program. Yes, I'm sure you're probably thinking I need my head examined by now. <laughs> Nevertheless, let me, uh, let me explore the journey. So I've always had a passion for public service. I just never really intentioned to have a public service career. I like to think that public service chose me. And my journey really started uh, when I decided to, to go to college during that Seton Law, that Seton, Seton Hall Law School experience. So because I didn't prep for college before, I had to take a lot of um, a lot of elementary classes just to get to the college level. So I'd moved to Florida and started taking courses at Broward College uh, shortly after having my, my daughter and recently married. And uh, I, because I never took math classes in high school, I struggled with the math. I mean, I was um, a, a co-op student. I took my main classes in the morning in high school. And then in the afternoon, I went to work. I was a work study student. So I never took, you know, the, the algebras, the um, geometry and so forth. So I had gotten to the point where I was almost ready to finish the degree as an associate's degree, but I needed to do the math and I could not pass the intermediate algebra class. I took the class once, by the time I got to the second test, I failed and I said, you know, I better drop it so I don't bring down my GPA. Took the class again, same thing happened. And then by the time I got to the third class, thank God I didn't give up because I, I did feel like giving up. By the time I got to the third class, I had a Russian teacher and I kid you not, he walked into the classroom and he said, this is the way they teach it in America. This is a lung, this is a lung, this is how you teach it. And it resonated with me because the way he taught it, it just clicked. I 
I was able to get through that class. I mean, I had help from my family who kept my daughter on Saturdays and I just camped out at the lab where there were tutors there to help me every time I got stuck. And lo and behold, I completed college algebra. I completed trigonometry with an A. And it was like all these years that I thought I wasn't good at math and that I couldn't do it. And I literally told myself that and believed that. And I actually became good at it. And that was another pivotal moment for me. That was a moment where I learned that I can do anything I want if I put my, my, um, my mind and, and my work into it. There's nothing that can stop me with hard work and a good attitude. So that was kind of, I mean, maybe these are some things that some people learn as a young child, you know, and, and you know, they, they just always think like that, but that was a pivotal moment for me. And uh, that's, that, that's where it started. So I wanted to go to law school. So as I'm finishing my classes at Broward College, I got a job at a law firm and I soon discovered that it wasn't really as exciting as I thought it would be. And around that time, uh, Microsoft came out with this certification called the MCSC. And people were taking these six month boot camps, learning the Microsoft product, how to support servers and networks and Active Directory was new then. And people were getting these certifications and coming out making like $40,000 a year with no college degree or anything. So I started thinking about that and I said, well, you know, maybe I'll take a semester off and do this Microsoft bootcamp, get the certification, get a job as a tech, and that will help provide for my family as I go through law school. So I took the, the bootcamp, took a, took a semester off from Bar College, took the bootcamp, passed the exam, landed a help desk position for Motorola in Boynton Beach. Now, clearly I was not a lifelong IT person. This was something that I just stumbled upon within the last six months. So there's a little insecurity there. You know, I'm working alongside people who are geniuses. They've been doing this since they were probably five years old. And, um, you know, there, there were some moments where I doubted myself, but I capitalized what I knew I had. I knew I had excellent customer service skills. I knew I had excellent organizational skills. And I knew I had excellent communication skills. So I took those and I worked harder than anybody else on that team. And within six months, I was a top call taker, receiving commendations and, and accolades left and right, and was shortly asked to be a leader on that team. And mind you, I was the one with the least experience in IT, but because of that hard work, because of the attitude, because of the willingness to volunteer for things that nobody else volunteered for going the extra, extra mile, it served me well. So I started to excel at IT and help desk and uh, decided to change my major because it sure looked like I was doing pretty good at IT and I was certainly making more money than uh, some of the people who were going to law school. <laughs> So shortly after that, I was fortunate enough to get a position at the town of Davie as a computer tech. And I started out on the bottom. I did everything from making cables, climbing in the ceiling, um, troubleshooting printers, building computer labs, um, just anything you can think of because it was a one-stop shop. There was one IT department responsible for everything. And I worked very, very, very hard. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of um, you know, volunteering for the things that nobody wanted to do, doing the things that nobody wanted to do with a great attitude. Again, the customer service, the communication, the organization, it served me well. And again, I may not have been the most technical person and maybe not even the most the genius on the team, but I quickly became a go-to person because I had a knack for making people feel comfortable, for explaining things to people, for speaking to people in a way that didn't belittle them and make them feel bad. And um, within, you know, within a few years, I completed the bachelor's degree, I'm sorry, I completed the associate's degree at Broward College. And then I was asked to lead the IT services for the police department. I worked very hard there as well, made a lot of connections, served with great pride, great dignity, 
And shortly after that, I received the Town of Davie Employee of the Quarter Award. Along with uh, another colleague of mine, we started the first IT disaster recovery plan. We didn't have one before, and that was immediately after Hurricane Wilma, where I also volunteered to work the Emergency Operations Center. I actually left my family and literally resided at the police department for the three or four days that power was down and you know people couldn't go out. And uh, again, these were opportunities that weren't given to me. They didn't fall in my lap, but I saw the opportunity, I seized the moment, and it served me well in my career and my progress. In, 20, in 2010, I received the Employee Spirit Award and I started again, excelling in my role, excelling in my reputation and getting more responsibility and more trust. And I realized that maybe I could potentially go into management with this. I mean, I'm doing a great job. People are telling me that I'm getting awards and so forth, but if I'm gonna go into management, I'm gonna need a bachelor's degree. I only have an associate's degree. Well wasn't planning on it, but, um, you know, went back to Broward College, and luckily for me, they had a uh, bachelor's in technology management, and I enrolled in that and completed that, graduated with honors, and in 2014, I was promoted to senior systems administrator, so now I'm the administrator who, who leads the other administrators, and I want to point out again, in between all of these accomplishments, the professional education, the awards, the promotions, there's a lot of volunteering going on. There's a lot of volunteering, there's a lot of networking, there's a lot of um, taking advantage of opportunities as they present themselves. I, I will have to say that one of my first leadership opportunities was not something that was given to me, it was something that I volunteered for. We started the strategic planning committee at the town of Davie. And of course, you know, it wasn't really glamorous. It's putting together a strategic plan, getting information, putting together metrics, putting together, you know, mission statements and so forth. So not the most glamorous thing to do, but I volunteered for it. Well, I was volunteered for it. And then I volunteered to take the role as chair. And because I had those organizational skills, I could set a plan, I could, um, delegate tasks, and I was very good at that, I excelled. And although I had never been considered for a leadership position before, I think it gave the people around me an opportunity to see that I had the propensity for leadership. So shortly after that, I was promoted to IT manager. And again, it wasn't something that dropped into my lap. I, I strongly believe it had a lot to do with the things that I volunteered for, uh, Take Stock and Mentoring Program, that was another program that I worked on, starting the disaster recovery policy. We created a computer lab for disadvantaged students in the Orange Park community in Davie, the Technology Advisory Committee. I volunteered for, as a chair for the Gifted Advisory Committee. I also volunteered for the Honor Fly Program, which is a program that um, takes that raises money for World War II veterans and flies them to their memorial in Washington, DC. And that opened doors for me with the mayor because I got to partner with her on that and we received an award for the work that we did for that. So that opened so many opportunities for me to network and engage with probably individuals I never would have had the opportunity to engage with if I would have just stayed in my little help desk role. Um, again, the strategic planning committee, I learned great skills from that with setting plans and achieving them and measuring progress. I also volunteered to be the chair for the customer service and process improvement committee. And of course, the advisory boards, which, you know, those are important to me because, again, a lot of the opportunity that I've received started at Broward College. And I want to be able to give back to the things that have given so much to me. So, um, and I, another thing I want to mention in 2014, you know, I, I'm just doing a good job because I feel that my work is a reflection of me and I want to do the best that I can. But when you're doing a good job, people hear about it, people talk about it. And I kid you not, I had IT directors from other municipalities actively and aggressively recruiting me. 
And I had never had this kind of attention before. And it was just like, wow, I, I must really be, uh, must be doing something pretty good. So of course, you know, my loyalty was to Davy because that's where, you know, my professional development happened, my growth. I established many wonderful relationships, which I still enjoy today. And, um, you know, I, I just didn't, didn't want to, to leave at the time. So in 2015, I received the Town Manager's Award for Dedication and Leadership. And in 2015, I was, later that year, I was promoted to IT manager overseeing technology services for both public, public safety and civilian populations, including emergency operations, geographic information systems, and in enterprise resource planning. I, I realized at that time that, well, if I could manage, maybe, maybe I could direct, who knew? So I realized if I was gonna set my sights on becoming a director or any kind of leadership role in public administration, I probably should pursue a master's degree. And at the time I had to decide whether I wanted to do the master's degree in IT or public administration. So I thought long and hard about it, although you know I, I'm, I'm an IT professional, I felt that the public administration uh, master's degree would give me um, a wider scope, if you will, in case I wanted to go outside of IT, but it was also help me if I stayed in IT because I learned a lot about leading a public organization, a lot about budgets, a lot about strategic planning, human resources, um, private, pri private public partnerships, and uh, I, I really walked away with a great education. If you are not in the Masters of Public Administration program at FIU and you want to take your career and your professional development to the next level, highly recommend it. And I always felt this way, but I had Dr. Rosenbaum actually put it in words for me when I interviewed him for one of the assignments that I had. And he, he said it in a way that I could re that resonated with me. He said, government and public administrators are responsible for allowing people to live good, safe, and successful lives. If you think about it, we are the rock of civilization. How can I drive in my car and go to the bank, go to the ATM safely? How can I live in my house and know that the builders of my house Used the right codes and were, you know, were inspected by the building officials and made, you know, made sure that they did things the right way. And if I get in trouble, I can pick up the phone and call 911 and public services, public safety services will be there in a matter of minutes. That's all because of public administration. So at the end of the day, no matter where you go or what you do, if you think about it, the core of human civilization is what public administrators do. And when he put it in those words to me, it's like, I knew that's why I wanted to be a public administration, but I just couldn't verbalize it that way. So that's kind of what, that's what made me say, yes, I definitely want to stay in public administration, whether I stay in IT or whether I go into another area. And that's the beauty of public administration. Wherever your skills are, or whatever your gifts are, there's so many areas that you can be of, uh, you can participate. You know, there's civil engineering, there's public safety, there's budget and finance, there's IT, IT security. I mean, there's just so many areas where there is a need for good quality talent and people with integrity. It's just, I, I can't think of being anywhere else in my life. Okay, so in 2016, I applied to the EMPA program and immediately after I started the program in 2017, an opportunity became available at Broward County Public Schools. This was very difficult for me to consider because I was so attached to the town of Davie and I had so many very special relationships there, which I still have today. And, you know, I almost feel like I was born and raised there you know, I started out as this little tech with very little experience and worked my way up to, to, to a, a position of influence, if, if you will. And, uh, but I'll be honest with you, you know, the higher I went, the more responsibility 
came and when you're working for an organization that supports public safety, it can be very demanding because the police department doesn't close on Thanksgiving. You know, the, uh, the, the, the fire department doesn't close because it's Veterans Day. So, you, you know, I, I reached a point where I felt like I was always on and I had very little time for really much else in my life. You know, there was a time where I probably worked 50, 60 hour work weeks. And in IT, you know, being a salaried employee, you know, sometimes people can take advantage of that because you're not punching a clock and you're getting the same salary whether you work 40 hours or whether you work 60 hours. You know, you're, you're judged by your results, not necessarily how many hours you work. So although it, it was wonderful and I was very proud and very happy, I really had to stop and think about this opportunity at Broward Schools because it was less demanding. demanding. It did offer me a sense of uh, more work-life balance. It did allow me to become more involved in some of the community organizations that I'd previously been involved with before, but had to take a step back because of you know, the demands of my job. So I went back and forth and it, it was a very difficult decision. I fasted, I prayed, I talked to people, I went back and forth, I changed my mind. I, it was a very difficult time. And, and I look back at what I went through and I wish I had known Dr. Patterson back then because she had us do an assignment in her class and we had to make a personal statement and we had to define our long-term and short-term goals. And I gotta tell you, it seemed like a very insignificant document and I didn't even wanna do it to be honest with you, but I did it and that helped define my goals and my principles and what I wanted to do and what was noise. Because it's very easy to get distracted with emergencies and, and projects that come up and urgent matters that come up and, and they're gonna come. However, it's always good to have something to root and ground you in, to remind you of why you're doing what you're doing and how you should be spending your time and making sure that all of the decisions that you make line up with that goal. If you don't have that goal and you don't have something to keep you grounded, you will be tossed and turned with whatever the wind blows at. So making that list now, you know, I, I, I have it now and I use it when I make any kind of decisions, when it involves my time, as far as my education and so forth. And if it doesn't fit with that, then maybe it's probably not for me. So as tough as it was and scary, because, you know, I'd been at the town of Davie for 15 years. I knew everybody. Everybody knew me. I had a great reputation. I was trustworthy. You know, I, people knew who I was. So there was a level of comfort, a level of security. And now I'm talking about going to Broward schools. And I kind of looked at it as I'm a big fish in a little pond. Now I'm going to be a little fish in a big pond. Nobody knows me. Nobody knows my background. I'm going to manage a team that, you know, they, what if they don't like me? What, you know, what if the culture doesn't work well with me. I mean, there were all of these what ifs and, and I, I seriously doubted myself and, and um, it took a lot of soul searching. And as I said, I, I looked, um, I, I spent some time with the chaplain at Davy PD and he didn't know my background. He didn't know what I was going to going through, but someone had invited me to uh, one of the prayer sessions. And the words that this uh, chaplain spoke to me, he said, make decisions based off principles and values and not circumstances. And I, the light bulb just went off. And I said, the circumstances are great. I love it here. I love you know, um, my relationships. I love my position. I love what I do. I have influence. I've, I've worked really, really hard to get to where I am today. But I knew that I was missing um, on being able to be involved with Lot of other things that were outside of work because I just couldn't do it. And I knew that this opportunity would create that, would create that space to spend more time with my family, more time with my church, more time with my community, and more time for volunteering. So as much as it wasn't an easy decision, it was scary, it wasn't safe, it was going into the unknown, it was in line with my principles and my values. So I took a leap of faith and I did it. And 
I was successful. I've been with Broward School Board for three years now. And I would say that in the three years that I've been there, I made a tremendous impact on the team that I'm working with. I'm very proud of my team, what we've accomplished in the last three years. We've saved the district over $80,000 and renegotiating and redeploying a new disaster recovery strategy. We've saved thousands of dollars with renegotiating contracts. We've implemented more structure. Um, we've, uh, we've implemented more collaboration and communication amongst the other teams. And I can go on and on about uh, how proud I am of what we've been able to accomplish. Now, I will admit I don't have as much influence and things move a lot slower at Broward Schools because it's a much larger organization. You know, I was very used to walking into the town administrator's office and say, hey, I have an idea and he would listen to me and we would work together on a plan. Well, you know, I, I don't just walk into the superintendent's office now and say, hey, Superintendent Runcy, I got an idea. <laughs> so I do miss some of that, but uh, I do enjoy having work-life balance. I enjoy being able to volunteer on all the different committees and advisory boards that I do. I enjoy mentoring. I enjoy being more involved in my church. And I just feel like I, I do have a little bit more of a well-rounded uh, existence. And uh, there's just so much opportunity. And, and I wanna also make note of the fact that when I came on board to Broward Schools, and remember one of my concerns was nobody knows me, they don't know my integrity, they, I have to build relationships all over again, I have to start all over. Well, a lot of that was done for me because a lot of the organizations that I volunteered for, they had people within the Broward schools and they vouched for me. I mean, I would walk into a room and I would see someone that I had worked with years ago and they would say, oh, you guys got Tamika, she's awesome. She's this, she's that. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to be humble, but uh, it was just like, wow. And then I even ran into some of the same vendors that I worked with at Davey, you know, AT&T and some of the other software vendors. And they would just tell the Broward Schools team of, you know, my, my reputation and the work. So I was so worried about having to start all over. And here it is, all that work that I did with being professional, being dependable, showing up, networking, going above and beyond, all of that served me so much well and really helped me solidify my role at Broward Schools. And I, I would have to include, I would have to conclude that part of my success was finding a niche and fulfilling it, right? So I knew that I wasn't the most technical person and I didn't have the most experience in IT. I was kind of a newcomer to the game, but I knew that there was sometimes a disconnect between the IT group and the business decision, the business decision makers in, in the operations. I knew that I had the knack for making people feel comfortable and, and explaining things and documenting things and organizing things, which to be honest, a lot of IT professionals don't necessarily have that. So I was able to fill in that gap and become very, very successful in a short amount of time, even though I didn't start at the, the same starting point as some of my other colleagues. I, uh, I do want to recommend a, a book by Simon Sinek called Finding Your Why. And I say that because, again, when it comes down to making those tough decisions in life about career, about uh, personal, family, if you know the why you're doing what you're doing, it helps drive uh, that motivation. I'll give you an example. If you love to watch birds and you have to build a birdhouse and put it in your backyard, you have to go to Home Depot, you have to get the wood, you have to get the nails, you have to measure. And some of that um, minutia could really get you discouraged. But if you focus on the outcome, sitting on your patio, enjoying a nice cool glass of iced tea, and watching those beautifully colored birds chirp and come and grace you with their presence, that will drive that motivation. Another example is building a, a butterfly garden. 
got to get your nails dirty. You got to get in the dirt and you got to dig and so forth. Who wants to do that? It could be very, very discouraging. And you could, there are tough days. I mean, as public, uh, public administrators, we have moments where sometimes the motivation, you know, and the inspiration is, is that tank is running a little low. But if you focus on the why and you know why you're doing what you're doing and you have a strategy and you have an outcome and you can envision that on those days when it seems a little tough, it will give you that juice to just keep on going. So um, I am looking ahead. So looking ahead, uh, short-term goals, I would like to become an adjunct IT professor at Broward College, my humble beginning. And I really hope to inspire more uh, minorities to uh, being attracted to STEM, specifically IT. I went to a Microsoft conference last year, and this conference had over 30,000 attendees, and there were very few minorities. There were so much, there was so much representation from so many other groups and ethnic groups. I just you know, I just wondered, I'm like, why isn't there more diversity here? So hopefully I can play a role in that. And that same person that inspired me to consider college in the 12th grade when I never considered it before, I hope that I can provide that for someone else. I am totally committed to a life in public service, a life in uh, public administration. And one of the, the areas I do want to focus on is cybersecurity. Um, the passion that I have for public service and STEM. I feel that, you know, giving back and being involved in a lot of the organizations that I am is only going to allow me to hopefully have a positive impact. And as far as the PhD program, I'm not fully committed yet, but I am definitely leaning towards it. And I hope that I could also have an impact on some of, some of the public policy, especially in light of, of this past year. So for the moment, my mission is to make a difference in the world and hopefully leave it better than I found it. So I'm going to leave you with three words before we open up for uh, questions and answers. Define, grind, and rewind. So define, you need to define your passion, define your purpose, define your values. Once you have that, that will drive your decisions and how you spend your time, how you invest your resources and your talents. And you won't be pulled uh, from different directions for things that don't really line up with those values. And it'll help you make decisions and make tough decisions because I had to make a really tough decision. It was not a comfortable decision. It was going to, to the unknown. But because I, I focused on my values, I was able to move past the fear, move past the insecurities, move past the uncertainties and go on and excel. Identify your goals, what you wanna achieve. If you've taken uh, Dr. Patterson's class, you've probably already done this. If you haven't, def define your uh, mission statement and your short-term goals and your long-term goals. And the thing is, your goals will change from year to year. My goals have changed, but your values, your purpose and your passion those are bedrock. They will never change and they will always guide you. They'll be your guiding principle. The grind is striving to be the best version of yourself. Even when you think nobody's looking at you, even when you think nobody's paying attention. I mean, there were many projects that I, were, I was asked to lead and work on and they really seemed insignificant, but I just gave it my best because that's part of my personality. I'm kind of like a high achiever but it served me so well later on because I reaped those dividends. Like I said, when I walk into a room and I see someone that I worked on a project with five or 10 years ago and they're singing my praises and you know, I long forgotten about that project or that engagement and the volunteer work, you know, I've, I've had people um, you know, commend some of the work that I did. So again, striving to be the best version of yourself, always wanting to be better Every day is an opportunity to learn something new. Uh, there's a project that I was asked to lead at Broward Schools that really, it's not really infrastructure related, but I was asked to lead it and I did. And I got a personal thank you from our CIO. Now, the CIO was not in any of our meetings. 
It wasn't in any of our project plans or anything like that. But I would imagine that the word got to him from those who I was working with on how well we executed the, pro, the, the, the project. And having that little letter of recognition, someone who I may see a once or twice a year, take the time to send me a thank you. It's like, oh, I didn't even know he was paying attention. So, <laughs> so that continuous improvement and going above and beyond and being open for new opportunities. And you know, even if it's a volunteer and you don't necessarily see the monetary value, I highly recommend it because it has served me very well. I also agree, I, I also wanna encourage you to read. I wasn't a reader growing up, but uh, of course, if you're in a master's program, you, you learn to become a reader very quickly. But I heard somewhere that a CIOs read at least two books per month. That can be difficult with family and work and so forth, but I recommend two apps. One's called Blinklist. It's a free app that goes over a book within about 12 to 13 minutes. And it's enough information to either strike your interest where you actually go out and buy the book or you just say, oh, that was cool. I didn't know that. And you move on to the next book. Another app I'd like to recommend is Libby. It's an app that allows you to download free audio books from the Broward County Library. And I've been able to go through a lot of books. I mean, I went through uh, The Dare to Lead by Brene Brown in like four hours while cleaning the house. I just put it on my, my, uh, my phone and I just let it play. So four books I, I do recommend that you read if you haven't already read, that's The Heart of Leadership by Mark Miller, Dare to Lead by Brene Brown, The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. These books have given me such insight that I've been able to use in, in my everyday work that, again, it has served me very well. Oh, okay, so I think I'll probably, oh, I, I forgot to rewind. So I said, define, grind, and rewind. So the rewind part, that's giving back. Always give back to what, whatever it is that's important to you. If it's mentoring, if it's your alma mater, if it's your faith, if it's your community, it seems initially that you are giving up something, giving time, giving resources, giving up effort, but you will get back so much more than what you give that it's, it's just, a, it's, a, it's an amazing ROI, return on investment. I sometimes say, how in the world have, did I sign up for all of these different activities? But I've gotten so much from them. Like I said, and in the, the course of my career, a lot of my success has not really been from just being the best technical IT person in the room, but because of all of those other extracurricular activities, the communication, the coordination, the organization, all of those skills combined has really propelled me. So always give back. And you know, I can't help but to think, had I not been on that uh, field trip to the Seton Hall Law School, I never would have thought about going to college. Had I not gone to college, maybe I would have never gotten the opportunity at the town of Davie. If I didn't get the opportunity there, I would have never gotten the opportunity or even imagined getting a master's degree. And good Lord, now I'm thinking about a PhD. I mean, this little girl from these drug addict parents and growing up in poverty. I mean, it's, you know, when I look back at it, it's amazing. And I didn't get there by myself. People believed in me. People saw something special. People encouraged me and gave me opportunities once I was able to show that I was worth it. So uh, again, I, I don't subscribe to that. Oh, you know, it's because I'm black and oh, because I'm a woman. And yes, there are some inequities and there are some, some challenges, but I also feel that I don't focus on that. I focus on being the best that I can be. I don't focus on the fact that sometimes I'm the only woman in the room or you know, I'm a woman leading a team of all men or maybe I'm the only female in the room. That may be the case, but that's not my focus. My focus is on being the best that I can be and the rest will take care of itself. Thank you so much. She has such amazing uh, little tidbits in there. And one thing going back to was 
a strong reputation. Uh, just watching and paying attention, um, but especially, and I think that's been a theme that's come out of the speaker series, is that as broad as public administration is, it's still a tight-knit community in many ways, and um, people talk and people take notice, and a lot of word of mouth um, leads to opportunities. Yes, indeed. We have about 10 minutes um, left, so I wanted to give this opportunity for any of the students that are participating to ask any questions, make any comments. Um, I, I know we have a few um, that are posting in the chat now, and just thank you. Great lecture, great presentation. Um, and if there are any questions, um, and I, I know, Laura, you, you used to work with um, Tamika and Davy as well, correct? <laughs> Yes, and her reputation did precede her. Everybody was very happy when Tamika would be the one to fix the problem because she always got it done. And she was there quickly. If she told you she was coming, you knew she was coming. Whereas some of the other staff, yeah, 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 I'll get to it. And it was like a week later and you still had a printer that wouldn't work. So yes, she really is top notch. Thank you, Laura. I miss you. I miss you too. <laughs> And I'm so great that you were able to join um, again because it does become we're again a very broad field, but becomes like family. Um, I think we're all working towards a common goal to try and make a difference um, and inspire others. And I know definitely your talk today, um, just looking at the comments, and I know I'm going to get a lot of feedback about it later, is that it's inspiring and how we can each kind of create our own niche and follow our passion. Um, and definitely a lot of them had to do a vision statement this semester, so reflecting on their own um, journeys and um, how to get there. And it's not always a straight line, and I'm glad that you mentioned how your path um, had curves and turns to it. Tamika, do you find this more advancement at the county level than at the municipal level? As far as? Uh, room for advancement for you. Oh. Other positions moving up, uh, becoming more management like you had wanted. I do, but there's definitely more layers of management at the district. So although I was probably next in line for a CIO at Davie, at, the, at Broward Schools, there's still another level of management before becoming a CIO, which really is a cabinet level. So uh, there are leadership opportunities there. But again, reflecting back on that personal statement, I would love to, to advance, but not at the price of not being able to have that flexibility of community engagement and work-life balance. And that's a great point to bring up because I think everyone has to do a little bit of soul searching in some sense to find out what's best for them, um, whether it's a big organization, it's a organization, uh, local, municipality, state, federal, nonprofit, um, even though the work is kind of related, there are so many differences in the way these organizations operate also. I wanted to, um, also in the comments, uh, thank you for sharing your journey with us. Uh, beautiful, amazing presentation, so inspiring. So just wanted to definitely make sure you saw some of the comments that are, are coming in the thank chat. You. And as we start to wrap up, um, I want everyone to join me um, in using the reactions to give a virtual round of applause. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. And again, thank you. And thank you for sharing. Um, as we're starting to wrap up, again, just any last comments or questions, feel free to ask them or post in the chat. And we look forward to seeing what's next. Um, and again, I'm glad that you could share your journey as far as not only as you finish up another master's degree in, in IT, um, but for those of you that haven't seen, um, I'll have to find the article and share it. You were featured recently in FIU News about your public service journey. So being able to just kind of share those um, and inspire others. Um, so we really appreciate that. And again, that's kind of the overall theme is that we appreciate the time that you came to sh and your service and your passion um, come across. Thank you. Thank you. You get more than you receive. Definitely. And, you know, and again, as you mentioned, you put it out there, people take notice and it leads to new opportunities. Um, Something that you couldn't even imagine. I mean, you might not see the dividends immediately, 
but uh, they they showed up later on down the line, and I was like, wow, I'm I'm really glad I did a good job when I worked with that person. <laughs> And one question that just came up towards the end is um, financing education. Um, one, you know, great thing about public services, there is still um, opportunities for tuition reimbursement if you work in certain municipalities, um, different grants and fellowships. Um, as you go up into graduate programs, there are opportunities for fellowships and assistantships. Um, so definitely as far as for different opportunities, any advice there? Uh, well, because I did my undergrad at Broward College, I mean, it was very inexpensive. So, you know, people who talk badly about community colleges, they get no love from me because that's where I started. And I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for uh, the community college. So my, my undergrad was not very expensive at all. I think altogether, I probably spent less than $10,000. Um, my graduate degree, that was a little bit expensive, but that was because I was in the EMPA program, which is a little different. It's, it's geared towards professionals. So a lot of services come with that. I mean, we had um, food catered, we had parking covered, you know, we were, um, we were already, most of us were already in leadership positions. So it was a little bit more expensive. And then the, um, the masters in IT, there are a lot of grants out there, especially for minorities and not even just minorities. Right now, there's such a shortage for cybersecurity specialists. The federal government is begging people right now to take those courses. I mean, there's, there's amazing opportunities out there. If I was starting all over again, I would certainly take advantage of those, but I'm hopefully within the next 10, 10 to 15 years, we'll be riding off in the sunset. <laughs> On that note, I want to remind that there are lots of scholarship opportunities out there. Definitely apply, um, you know, through the ASPA South Florida chapter, through FIU, through Academic Works. Um, and again, just reaching out to those resources. That's another reason why those professional connections are so important. Um, perhaps the recommendations from employers, from professors. So again, just making those connections, you never know where they may end up leading to and opportunities. So again, thank you so much. We really appreciate you just taking your time and expertise on this evening. I know after you've worked a long day, I wanna thank all of the students that were able to join us this evening. Again, thank you for your time. And we look forward to keeping in touch and seeing where the next step of your journey takes you. Very much so. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tamika.